A week and a half ago, we started moving into our new house. On Thursday, I got a phone call. And I looked down, and it was from my wife. And I said, hello? And I heard on the other end, hi, Dad. And it was my oldest son. He's six. He said, Dad, I've got an important question for you. I said, okay, buddy, what is it? He said, no, Dad, this is the most important question you're going to be asked today. I said, okay. He said, it's really important. I said, all right. He said, no, Dad. It's really, 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 really important. I got it, buddy. What is it? Are you ready for it? Yeah, I'm ready for it. Can, can, you, can we just get to the question? But, Dad, it's really, really, really important. I got that. What is it? Where are the chargers for the PlayStation 4 controllers? <laughs> I'm like, but I, I, think they're, I think they're under the TV cabinet. I'm not really sure. We're living out of boxes still. I'm not entirely sure where they are, but check under there. Dad, this is the most important question of the day. I need, an answer. I need you to know, where are the controllers? Where are the chargers for the controllers? But I, I think they're under there. That's the best I have. Well, I sure hope so. I love you, Dad. Bye. <laughs> My six-year-old's clapping back. I'm like, I, I don't know. I don't know. We're, we're, we're asked questions sometimes in life. And sometimes the questions that we're asked in life are a big deal. This morning, we're going to look at two different portions of Scripture. One is in Matthew 22. If you have your Bible apps on your phones or your tablets, you can go there. We're going to start in verse 34. But we're going we're gonna to join the scene where Jesus is talking with a group of very religious people. They're very religious people. And yet there's two distinctions amongst these groups that Jesus is talking to. The first group is a group called the Sadducees. And basically what you need to know about the Sadducees is they denied any resurrection, really any part of the afterlife. They really wanted God on their terms. They wanted a God that they could fully wrap their minds around, that everything rationally, according to what they could come to terms with, made sense. They wanted a God that they could explain. They wanted God exclusively on their terms. And they throw out a question to Jesus and Jesus just, just obliterates that. He silences them. And then there's another group there. Now, now, the Sadducees, as well as the Pharisees, both very religious, both hate Jesus. They want nothing to do with Jesus. They are not about Jesus at all. And they do not like what Jesus is proclaiming. And so the other group, the Pharisees, who, who, have, who want to follow the law to the T, and they look at Jesus as an abomination is everything that the law should not be. They both want to destroy Jesus. They don't really even like each other that much. They just have one common enemy. It's kind of like in politics today, the, the saying goes, politics makes strange bedfellows. You, you don't like one another, but you really hate somebody else, so you're willing to tolerate each other just to get rid of the person that you really hate. That's what's going on here amongst these religious people. And the Pharisees on the other side, they see that Jesus had just obliterated the Sadducees with their question that they've asked him. And so now they decide it's their turn. That's what's going on when we join the scene. But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. So they ask Jesus a question, but it's not just a question to understand something. It's a question with an agenda. And maybe you've been disposed in court. Maybe you've been in a, a work environment like this. Maybe it's, it's with your spouse. But you've been asked a question with an agenda. And you can kind of feel it, especially if it's in more of a familiar setting, like with a spouse or a kid. You can kind of feel the question with the agenda coming, you know there's probably more to this question than meets the eye, and so you tense up a little bit. You're like, all right, where's this going? And then you start to answer. But if you're in a work environment, especially a work environment that's become very toxic, and, and there's a lot of politics going on, and a lot of people are struggling for position or power, or certainly if you've ever been in a courtroom and you're being questioned by a, a prosecutor or, or another attorney being cross-examined, you know that you're all always being asked 
a question with an agenda. And so Jesus can see this coming from a mile away. They huddle up, and they're, they're talking amongst themselves, and they point out the lawyer, and they say, you, you come up, and you ask the question. And here's the question. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And here they think they've got Jesus stumped. Realize there are 613, 613 laws in the Old Testament. 613 laws in the Old Testament. What they don't realize is that Jesus is God who gave the law. So in essence, what this question is like, it's like asking a parent who your favorite kid is. All right, You probably have one, but you probably shouldn't answer the question. And so Jesus, <laughs> Jesus is there, and I'm kidding. Not really. I'm kidding. We, if you're a kid, we love you all equally, just differently. All right? But... But our love for you is equal. And here the question is of Jesus, who they don't realize it, but he is the one who's written the law. And they ask him, what is the great commandment of the law? And the trap of this question is, as soon as he answers the question, well, then he's going to diminish all the other laws. And so then we've got him and we can levy the claims against him that he doesn't take all the laws into account. That's the approach. And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And they say, Hey, Jesus, out of all the laws, out of all 613, which one really matters? Which one's the best? And Jesus answers, love God. Love God with everything you are. Love God with everything you are. This is the foundation. This is the building block of everything else. If, you, if you've ever gone through a building project, you understand. If the foundation isn't right, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what's going to happen with the rest of the building. You're in for a disaster. If the foundation isn't secure, you are in for a disaster. And so this is the building block upon which everything else rests. This fact, to love God with all that we are. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He keeps going. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So what's first? What must come first? The thing that must come first is a love for God with all that we are. This is what has to be foundational. This must be the starting point. Without this starting point, the rest will not be sustainable. It must start here. We must passionately love God with everything that we have. And then after that, the next step is to love our neighbors. It's to love others. Of all 613 laws that the Old Testament is comprised of, Jesus boils it down and he says this, Love God with everything, with your whole being, with everything that you are, with everything you have within you. Passionately love God. And oh, by the way, the second commandment is just like the first. But once you do that, you better love everybody else just like you love yourself. That's the answer that Jesus gives to what is the greatest commandment. And he says, oh, by the way, everything else that's mentioned in all 613 of those laws, everything else that is mentioned 
hinges on these two things. That you first and foremost love God with everything you are and you love everyone you encounter. Here's the deal. We make it so difficult. We make it so hard. We complicate things. And we understand life is complicated. Life is challenging. But we do ourselves an incredible disservice because we get away from the basics. And we need to be reminded of these two simple and yet incredibly difficult things. Because this is the foundation. And everything else hinges on these two things. I promise you this. If you are experiencing turmoil in your life, look back and ask yourself the question, have I loved God with everything that I have, with everything that I am, and have I loved everyone else that I've encountered in the way I love myself? Because when we love God with everything that we have, we realize that we have to die to ourselves. That we elevate the desires of God rather than the desires of our heart. And once we start to get a handle on that and we build that foundation where we really elevate the things of God more so than our own pursuits, when we really start to get that started, oh, by the way, it doesn't become easier because now we have to love everyone else in the same way we love ourselves. That's why at Lakeside we have to be driven by love. It's not just some feel-good thing that we throw out there that we want to love everybody we encounter, that it's all about love. It's not something that we just throw out there because, it's no, the reason that we're all about love is because when Jesus has a chance to boil it all down, that's exactly what he does. It's all about loving God with everything that you are and loving everyone you encounter. And let's not make it more complicated than that. Let's just make sure that this is what guides us. That first, the first thing that guides us, the very first thing that drives us is a desire with everything that we are to love God. And then secondly... Let's make sure with everything that we are that we desire to love each other in the same way that we love ourselves. Jesus is quoting here Deuteronomy. So on your phones or your tablets, you can go to the book of Deuteronomy. It's the fifth book of the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 6. This command was given for the very first time. Let's read those words. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the the Lord is one. And so I just want to pause there just, just for a moment and realize that this is a statement that there is one God exclusively. This isn't denying the Trinity, but he's saying that this is a monotheistic thing. There is only one real legitimate God and, and the question that, that we need to ask is, so what does our response to that need to be? The fact that there is a God, how do we need to respond to that? How do we need to respond that there is something greater than us at work here? That there is a creator, that there is someone who laid out this world. How do we respond in light of that? And what does our response need to be with the knowledge that there is, in fact, a God? Well, next verse gives us that answer. Our response needs to be this, that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. That because there's a God, our response needs to be that we elevate and we love God with everything that we are. And then Deuteronomy continues, And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. 
keep this theme central in your life. Keep this theme central in your life. Take it with you everywhere you go. Do not shake it. Do not remove it. Make it permanent. Keep it with you everywhere you go. This is the central theme of your life. Never forget it. Take it with you. Now, Some of you have chosen to do that with things in your life. With tattoos. And you've, you've put them on your body because they have significance to you. Some of you may have put something on your body because you, you had a little bit of a, a crazy night and, and now it's with you for the rest of your life. Uh, whatever the case may be. Some of you, you're carrying that with you and you're taking it with you. And, and here at Lakeside, we're not like, oh, you have a tattoo. God doesn't love you. No, we're like, that's cool. You know, that's, that's cool. You have a tattoo. In fact, we want to do something. If, if, you have, if you have tattoos, that, that you can show us. Now, we understand some of you may have tattoos that either say something or are somewhere we don't need to see. But if you have tattoos that you can show us, then, then show it to us this week. And for, for the best tattoo that we see, uh, we're, we're going to throw a little gift card your way, all right? So here's what you need to do. Uh, for those of you who, who are on social media, which is all of you, because Facebook was originally designed, right, to to get dates and then mom started getting on and that was the death of it and then they're like oh now we've now we got a real problem and then the, the grandparent market just blew up and so that's why everybody's on tinder i know kitties but for those of you who, who are now on facebook and and that's most of you over 30 instead of under 30 which was the original design of facebook but post it on facebook and tag us all right and use use the hash, hashtag lakeside I'll go, but we want to see your tattoos we're Listen, we're a community. We're, 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 part, of, we're part, of, part of celebrating each other and encouraging each other. And if you thought something was cool enough to put it on your body, then show it off and let us see it. And we're excited about that. And you'll get a gift card if it's cool enough, all right? So just, just tag us that. If, if you're like, yeah, Facebook's lame, then hit us up on Instagram. And if you're not following us on either Facebook or Instagram, well, you're a little late to the party, but we still love you. So you can find us on Facebook at Lakeside Community Church. You can find us on Instagram at Lakeside Algoma. Go ahead and start following. You got your phones out anyways, we know. So go ahead right now. Just pull it up. You're multitasking. We get it, all right? It's not 1990 anymore. So you can still listen to somebody and follow somebody on Instagram. That's fine. Just start surfing a little bit. Now, don't go scrolling once you follow us, all right? Back to the Bible app. But after you followed us, then, then hit us up this week. So post your tat, all right, with a, with tag us in it, put the hashtag Lakeside Algoma, and the coolest tattoo, yeah, you're getting really excited, I know, you're like, I got, <laughs> Michelle's like, I got 17 to choose from, so good luck, people, all right, and hit us up with all 17, that's cool, uh, but, but just tag us in all of them, and, and then whoever's got the coolest tattoo, and I'm not going to decide that, because then everybody would be like, oh, well, Brian doesn't think my tattoo is cool, and he thought this tattoo was cool, but whatever, we're just going to have a little bit of fun with it, but hit us up this week, tag us, and let's see some of the cool tattoos that people here at Lakeside have. So this idea, but this idea of taking something with you in your heart, carrying it with you, and I know some of you right now are like, oh, this goes against everything that my grandparents taught me when they started taking me to church about <laughs> tattoos. Because I got a verse in Deuteronomy to show him about tattoos. We'll talk about that later. All right, so <laughs> this idea of taking something with you and carrying it everywhere. This idea to love God with all that we are needs to be central to our lives. In the same way, when you get a tattoo, it's not gone. It's not easily removed, and it's with you. It's a reminder. That's the principle here. That we love God with all that we are, and it's something that we take with us and we carry with us. And what's the next step? And you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise, 
It's only after you own it that you can pass it on. It's only after you own it that you can pass it on. And then he says, you own this, you personally, you own this, that you love God with everything that you are. And the next step of that is to invest in the next generation, to invest in your kids. And you talk with them and you teach them and you remind them and you burn it in their hearts too. That when you sit, when you walk, when you lie down, it literally in every situation, in everything you do, you own this, that you love God with everything that you are. And you never miss an opportunity, whether it's sitting or walking or laying down, whatever the case may be, that is every function in life, whatever the case may be, you pour it into your kids. So this could permeate their hearts. My phone rang five minutes later. Hey, Dad. Hey, bud. I need to talk to you. All right. I'm going to go up to my room because this is a private conversation. Because anytime we get on our kids, we, we try not to do it in front of the other kid, and we try to, try to have a private conversation with them. So hold on, Dad, I'm going to go upstairs. Okay, bud. I listen to him as he walks upstairs. He closes the door. I can hear the bed squeak as he sits down on the bed where he and I have had conversations. And he says, Dad, you need to be responsible for your own things. It's no one's responsibility in this house to pick up after you other than yours. And you need to keep track of the things that you have so that when you need them or other people need them, (laughs) you know where they are. The kid is using my words against me. And it's not exactly like the PlayStation 4 is something I get to spend a lot of time with, with two kids in my house. But there have been conversations that we've had in that room about him knowing where his things are. About it being his responsibility. And in that moment, the things that I taught him were, yes, misapplied, (laughs) but were repeated back to me. Parents, I just want to encourage you. They're always watching. And you aren't going to be perfect. So just, listen, just free yourself of that right now. Do the best you can. And you're going to blow it. And there are going to be some ways you don't measure up to whether it's some standard you've built up in your head or some standard your mother-in-law's built in your head or your mother's built in your head, whatever the case may be, or grandma, whatever the case may be. You're, you're not going to measure up to everything that you've dreamed and thought. So just free yourself of that ridiculous guilt right now and do the best you can. And parents, in every situation, make sure that in your own life, you are first and foremost loving God with everything that you have. And secondly, that you're loving others. And then never miss an opportunity. Never miss an opportunity. To pour that in to your kids. And you aren't going to be perfect. And so when you fail, when you snap at them when you shouldn't have, just go to them and admit your fault. 
Let them see humility. Ask for their forgiveness. Allow them to dispel grace and mercy and allow them, as they're growing, to understand what that means and why they have to do that because there are going to be numerous opportunities where they need to receive grace and mercy as well. We've said it before and we believe it. Parenting is incredibly challenging, so we're not here to beat you up. There are enough people to do that. We're here to celebrate you and encourage you and to support you. And so that is why a few weeks ago we announced that we are beginning the process of bringing in a family life pastor to join the team here at Lakeside. Now, I want you to understand that that's somewhat vague, and so I want to flesh out a little bit of what those responsibilities will be on a very practical standpoint. But before I do that, I want to be very clear that our approach to to helping your children develop spiritually is this, that we believe it is your primary job and responsibility, not ours. We believe that God puts parents in place to be that picture of love, to point their kids to Jesus. Now, that being said, we are not going to come into your space and try to take over your responsibility. What we are going to do is we are going to be your biggest advocate. We are going to be your biggest cheerleader, and we are going to be your biggest supporter that we possibly can be. And so we are going to celebrate you. We are going to help you with resources, and we are going to do our best to further that knowledge and to further that and to help push them in that direction. But it is not exclusively our responsibility. Instead, we want to be seen as a support for your responsibility. And so with that, the role of the family life pastor will be other things, but essentially these three functions, they will be, they will be leading and spearheading along with other people who are already in these roles. So it's not like as soon as somebody comes in, the volunteers who are already in these roles no longer have a place or they're off the hook. All right? We're going to continue to use their gift set. But first, the role of the family life pastor, they're going to enhance small groups here at Lakeside. They're going to enhance small groups here at Lakeside. The reason being, it starts with you. It starts with you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. It starts with you. If we're going to raise the next generation to passionately pursue Jesus, then we need to passionately pursue Jesus. And the best way to do that is in community. Second. They're going to oversee and spearhead children's programming. They're going to oversee and spearhead children's programming. We have in place right now some programming that we are incredibly excited about. We've just launched a new curriculum. We've, we've instilled new leaders. Phyllis did a phenomenal job, but she said at this stage in her life, she wanted to, she wanted to go into just... Just be a teacher instead of running the whole program. And so within the year, Rebecca Wyatt has done a phenomenal job taking taking that and continuing to run with what Phyllis started. And Phyllis today is down teaching the kids. So it's not like she quit and she wasn't tapping out. She just said, for me, it looks a little different in this stage of my life what volunteering looks like. And so we are so incredibly thankful for the years and years that Phyllis ran children's ministry here. And I want you to know that it's still in very capable hands. And Rebecca Wyatt is doing a phenomenal job down there. We've just launched a new curriculum. And then with the Lakeside Littles, I'm biased, okay? So you've got to understand that because my wife, Brooklyn, she's the one spearheading that area. But I believe she's doing a phenomenal 
phenomenal job there in Lakeside Little. So understand, we have great things in place right now with children's programming. And it's not like when the family pastor comes in, we're, we're sending a letter to Rebecca in Brooklyn saying, thanks, your services are no longer needed. No, what we're doing is we're bringing in an advocate and somebody who has even more time and even who can, who can spend even more time going over these things can take it to yet another level. Why? Because kids deserve it. Because kids deserve it. And the, the, the other aspect of this, the family life pastor is going to be overseeing and developing student ministry. Overseeing and developing student ministry. And we understand our student ministry is not as strong right now as our children's ministry. And that's nobody's fault. We're not blaming anybody. It's not like somebody has failed. It's just we need to, we need to look at the programming. And we need to look at, at what we're doing there. And we understand that. But we can, we can only tackle so many projects. And for us, we had to make a strategic choice. And that strategic choice was to start with the kids and get that area firing on all cylinders before we got the student ministry firing on all cylinders. Why? Because the kids' ministry is a feeder system into the student ministry. It's not that we don't think students matter. Just the opposite. We love students. Students, we love kids, and what I want you to hear me saying is that we are committed. We are committed to taking our programming and taking it to an even greater level. Why? Because there are kids and there are students who desperately need to be reached for Jesus. And as a parent, you have the hardest job in the world. And we want to come alongside you. And we want to support you. We want to encourage you, and we want to help you. And so the fact that we're bringing in a family life pastor does not mean that the people who are functioning in these roles currently aren't doing a good job. What it does mean is that we're bringing in intentionally someone who can pour even more time and energy into these areas so that we can see even more lives changed. Because that's what drives us. You've heard me say it before, and I'll say it again, because this is our mantra, this is our motto, this is what we're all about. Lakeside exists to help people move one step closer to Jesus and reach those who are far from him. And I look at the state of the world right now. And I see a world that is in desperate need of Jesus. And if we can get them while they're young, it's not that we're brainwashing them. It's not that we're manipulating them. But if we can, if we can pour in to kids and to students, imagine the regret that they'll never experience because they instead made the choice to walk with Jesus. Imagine the impact that they will have for those extra 15 or 20 years that you wish you had. Imagine the impact that they will have because they walked with Jesus during those years. Yeah, kids are the future, but they're also now. And they're today. And we're just unapologetic about the fact that we're crazy about kids. And we love students. Even the ones that look at you and like, yeah, I don't like you. I hate you. I don't want to be here. Good. We still love you. You know, we do. We do. And in 15 years, some of you will be like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I was such an idiot. And in 15 years, some of them will still be an idiot. You know, I, it's just, it is what happens, all right? It's what happens, but we're going to still love them. It's what we're all about. So, that's why we're looking at bringing in a family life pastor. Not to, not to do the role of the parent, but to support, to encourage, and to help every step of the way. God, I pray that we would be people who are driven by a love for you. And I pray, God, that we would be people who are driven by love for others. 
We make it so difficult sometimes. We, we, we make things so complicated. And I pray when we just boil it all down, you'd help us just remember. It's all about loving you and loving each other. And so, God, I pray that you'd give us wisdom as we move forward in this pursuit. I pray that you would bring us just the perfect addition to this team. God, somebody that would help take our children's and our students' programming and our small groups to the next level. God, someone that would help us see lives changed. That's what it's all about. So God, help us point people to you. Work through us, we ask. And do some incredible things here for your glory. In your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen.